Today, we're introducing a new sermon series here at Springwood called The Good Old News. Now, as firm believers in the gospel of Jesus, the word gospel, I think a few of you may know this, but if you don't, the word gospel is actually translated to mean good news. That's what gospel means. When people say, preach the gospel, you're saying, preach the good news and the good news of what Jesus has done for us. But we're also believers in the sense that we appreciate both the Old and New Testaments as equal revelations of God's plan for the redemption of humanity. And we seek as believers, or we should seek as believers, to examine the grace and salvation of Jesus within the Old Testament. He's not just in the New Testament. He's in the Old Testament. This is why we have the title, The Good Old News, for this quarter. So it's our hope that we will better appreciate the glimpses and reflections of the gospel of Jesus through the Old Testament. So that we, as beautiful as, as what Jesus, the picture of Jesus is in the New Testament, that we're not limited to thinking that he's just in the New Testament, as beautiful as it is, but seeing that his love for us goes much, much further back, even to the beginning of time itself. So then, let's do that today. Let's look at the gospel story at the start of the Old Testament in Genesis. In the beginning... There was no sin. And while there was no sin, there was still an understanding among the heavenly beings of the universe. There was still an understanding of a consequence that would take place as a result of sin. And we know that it says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. And this was the awareness that even though sin had not taken place... Those in the universe, the sinless beings, had an awareness that the wages of sin is death. If you sin, you must die. This was actually explained to Adam and Eve by God himself in the Garden of Eden when he commanded them not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So here it is. It says it right here in Genesis 2. So this is all the way in Genesis 2, almost the first chapter. Second chapter of the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 17. This is God speaking to Adam and Eve. And he says, after he tells them you can eat whatever you want, he says, but, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Why? What's the big deal with eating fruit? Some people are like, what's... Why, why is he so pedantic about this? It was the only limitation he had put on them. It was just a, it was just a sign of loyalty. The, the thing is, eating the fruit, the only rule that they had to follow would go against the desires of God. And that is the most basic definition of sin you could have. What is sin? Sin is going against the desires of God. That's what it is. We have all these commandments and we say, if you break them, you sin. It's because they're, it's stating this is what God wants. And so if you go against what he wants, that's what sin is. And the natural consequences of going against the desires of God, the life giver, if he's the life giver, if you go against life, it's death. God is life itself, and if you're not for life, the alternative is death. To sin at its basic level is choosing death instead of life. Now, maybe death isn't going to happen today, maybe not tomorrow, but one day the consequences of breaking the law will happen. And this is what the beings of the universe, this is what Adam and Eve was told. Again, sin is going against the desires of God. It's doing what he asks you not to do. Sin, in its essence, is making what you want more important than what God wants. Now, justice 
is the enforcement of someone getting what they deserve, right? When, people, when we send people to the courts because they've broken the law, we want justice as human beings. We want people to get what they deserve. Justice is all about cause and effect in a moral sense. But in another sense, thinking of a spiritual sense, justice is the natural consequences of sin being carried out. Not only is death the consequence for sin in terms of justice, but it's also the natural consequence of sin. Because here's the thing. Sin separates us from God. I'm sure this happens to you because it happens to me on a daily basis, a weekly basis. When I do something that I know is the wrong thing to do, the last thing I feel like doing is going to God about it. Right? When you do the wrong thing, if you're like me, you're not going to want to talk to God about it. You're not going to want to read your Bible about it. Why? Because that's what sin does to us. It separates us from God. And if you think, but but isn't the consequences for sin death? It is. I'm going to get to that. The the real-time consequences is is it separates you from God when you sin. That's why you don't feel like praying. That's why you don't feel like going to church when you do the wrong thing. Because everyone knows no one wants to be a hypocrite. Sin, God doesn't actually go anywhere. But what sin does, it prevents us from being in his presence. Okay? That's why it separates us. And not being in God's presence means not being in the presence of life itself. That's why it leads to death. Lucifer did not like this concept of justice. I'm talking about the devil for those who may not know who Lucifer is. He was once an angel of light. He was once good. But something happened. We don't completely know what. But he did not like this concept of justice. He didn't, like, he didn't think that the creator should determine what was right and what was wrong. He thought that what his desires were should be at least on the same level as God. And he didn't think that God's desires should be more important than his desires. He was really into fairness. And you can see why sometimes being fair could be a good thing, but it could not be a good thing too sometimes. Satan wanted to do what went against God's wishes. And he didn't think that any rule should be carried out if it went against what he wanted to do. And so he justified it and he said, well, this isn't fair on principle. So he declared to all the angels in heaven that the law of God prevented true freedom in the universe, and only without God's law would people be truly free. Sometimes we hear little bits of this um, where people are like, we'd be better off if we didn't have the rules and, and the government's doing this and the police are doing that and all this sort of stuff. In some ways I agree, but if you've ever watched on the news media a place where anarchy is taking place, you see this form of freedom being carried out. And that form of freedom where there are no rules whatsoever is not a safe place to be. He told the rest of the angels that lawlessness would improve everyone's existence because everyone would get what they want. And he called God a dictator for not allowing his idea of freedom to reign in heaven. And so... We won't get into all the thing that happened afterwards. There was a war and God kicked Satan and the angels who sided with him out of heaven. But God allowed Satan and his fallen angels to continue to exist. And here's another question that people bring up. If God is good, why didn't God just destroy Satan if he broke the law? We wouldn't have all these issues we have today if he had just wiped out Satan. Some would say that our life would be much better if he had done that. But here's the thing. God allowed Satan and his angels to continue to exist for a limited time in order to prove the forces of evil wrong. Okay? You see, here's the scenario. 
If God destroyed Satan and his angels at the beginning of their rebellion, as some say would make things much better, everyone, all the beings in the universe, humanity and everyone else as well, because it's not just us, would forever wonder if Satan and his angels were destroyed simply because God wanted absolute obedience. And because of that, people would likely obey God out of fear. But God doesn't want people to obey out of fear. God doesn't want people to obey because they uh, want to make sure they don't die. Sometimes people become Christians and, and do lots of things as because they see Christianity as a fire escape from hell. But that's not why we ought to follow God. God doesn't want us to obey because we're terrified of him blotting us out. And so, to, so God allowed evil to continue in order to prove what the result of evil would result in. He wanted to show everyone without a shadow of a doubt, you need to listen to me because it's for the best. So when Adam and Eve sinned, the angels of evil celebrated what they declared as a victory. We've won the humans over to us. These newly created beings, they, they're on our side. We're going to overthrow the government. And the beings of the universe watched the scenes unfold on earth with mixed emotions. This is what the angels in heaven would have thought. They would have thought, I agree with what God said, but how is the master going to prove Satan wrong? And you think, how, why would they think that? This is why. Because it was a catch-22. If God allows sinners to live, how can he be called just and fair? Because the consequences of sin are death. So if he just gives everyone a free pass, how can he be considered just? But if he destroys sinners, how can he be called merciful and loving? You see, and this is the argument Satan gave to all the angels. God cannot be just and merciful. But when you read the Bible, you'll see justice and mercy. They're interchanged all the time in the stories. God is just and God is merciful. And Satan said, that is impossible. You cannot be just and merciful. You can only be one or the other. Because you're either neglecting the consequence or you're not being loving because you're just blotting people out. So did you know that the angels in heaven, because of this, they actually had something that we have now, which was faith. They didn't know how God was going to answer this conundrum. So the angels in heaven actually had to have faith. They had to trust that God was going to answer the question, even though they didn't know the answer to it. At least they understood that up until the cross, because at the cross, they could see that the argument was finished. God's angels watch in horror as God, their master and creator, chose some of the animals that he created so lovingly, and he took away the life of those animals in front of Adam and Eve. The life giver became the life taker. And with tears and he, he took the, with tears streaming down his face, the creator stripped the skins off these creatures so that the two humans could have clothes to wear to cover their nakedness. And then the angels watched as the two humans were escorted out of heaven, never to return to what should have been their forever home. And Adam and Eve fell to the ground in horror as they experienced the consequences of their sins being carried out on innocent creatures that they actually knew as their friends. Think about it. Adam and Eve, their role when they were created was to look after all the animals on earth. And we think of looking after animals as pets and stuff. They would have seen them as friends. They would have been able to communicate with them much better than us. They were their, care, their caretakers. They would have been close to those animals. 
And they would just watch these innocent creatures get killed because of what they did. And all around them, death began to, t- to take hold of every living thing on earth. They and all the animals and plants began to age. Hate to break it to you, but aging is a sign that death takes place. The animals who were all plant eaters like humans soon scattered as some animals began to prey on other animals. Leaves began to fall for the first time. Flowers began to fade. And the nice warm Brisbane temperature that was everywhere on earth. And when I say the nice warm Brisbane temperature, I don't mean the summer, I mean the rest of the year. That nice perfect temperature that is here that you guys take for granted all the time. You think that it gets cold here. It really does not. That temperature changed. And I don't know if it got hotter or colder for them. I think it got a bit colder, and I think they just they started to shake for the first time. They felt cold. And it all happened somewhat gradually, but death on earth did start with the sin of the humans. And after the creator took the life of the creatures in order to clothe Adam and Eve, he formed a pillar of stone by the gate of Eden. And in my mind, I imagine being God and being able to create things by by speaking. I just imagine him going like this, and this pillar just rising out of the ground. And I imagine in my head with just a stroke of his hand, a tree falls down and breaks into pieces. And after a glance by their master, Adam and Eve, they begin to pile the wood. They're not really sure where this is going, but they start piling the wood on top of this stone altar. And they waited to experience what would be one of the last Things they would ever do with God in human form. See, before this, God used to walk around with them just like we do. But this is going to be the last time that was going to happen. And a soft sound caused the two humans to turn as a lamb walked towards their creator. And with a loving smile towards the little ram, the creator took it up in his arms And cradled it like a mother would cradle a baby, beaming with joy. But after some time, the smile faded from the master's face and a look of utter sadness grew. And soon Adam and Eve cried as they saw their beloved creator, the king of the universe, break down and start sobbing with this lamb in his arms. Could you imagine the most powerful being in the universe crying, sobbing? I'm sure the sound of the creator sobbing would have been felt everywhere in the universe. And after a while, the creator gently took the lamb and put it into Adam's arms. And then a look of terrible realization came upon Adam and Eve's face. And Adam cried out to God, no, please, please, Lord, not this one. And then God saying back, yes, I'm sorry, my children. But in order for you to be clear from your guilt, you must kill this innocent lamb. And I imagine Eve crying out, but it's done nothing to deserve death. It was us who sinned, please. He's our friend. Yes, he's completely innocent, Eve. But would you be able to exchange your death sentence with that of Adam or another sinner? No, master, Adam has the same sentence as I do, and and another sinner would have the same sentence. We would just exchange our death sentences with each other. And God said, 
This is why an innocent creature, an innocent lamb must take your place so that you can live. I imagine Adam asking, but can an animal's life be exchanged for ours, master, a human's? And God's saying, no, you are above any other creature who has been created on this world. The death of an animal will never replace the death of a human being. Then why? Why must we do this? Your consequences and guilt can only be completely exchanged with a fellow human being who is sinless or a being of greater worth than yourselves. And Eve asked, can we, being evil, have children who are innocent from sin, Lord? And I imagine the Father God turning away at this point and being quiet for a few moments as he looked up to heaven. And when he turned back, the Creator looked at his two children and said, Do you remember what I said to the enemy back in the garden? And Adam, Adam said, that, You said that our seed would crush his head and that the enemy would bruise his heel. God for a moment seemed quite angry and said, The accuser will pay dearly for what he has done to you. He has robbed me of my children. And he will pay for that. I promise you. But one day a child will be born who will walk without sin. And he will save my children from death eternal by exchanging his pure life for theirs. And the master looked at the lamb cradled in Adam's arms, and he continued, but until that day comes, a clean and innocent animal such as a lamb must be killed in your place. Not because an animal's death could ever equal your own, but because the animal will represent your future redeemer who will one day exchange his perfect life for the lives of all humanity. And with that, the creator disappeared from view, never to be seen by Adam and Eve again. And they looked at each other's tear-stained face, and then they looked down to the lamb, and they heard their master's voice call out again, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will always be here even though you won't be able to see me anymore. Your sins have separated you from me. And after a few moments of silence, with great difficulty due to his love for the lamb, Adam killed the innocent creature and placed its limp body on the altar. And fire came down from the sky and consumed the lamb. And though filled with great sadness, a feeling of peace and hope came over the two humans as they confessed their sinfulness to their creator, to their father. Thousands of years later, we now see Jesus sitting in the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus is praying alone to his father in heaven. And in his mind, he remembers the original garden on earth and he thought about the little lamb in the arms of his father. He remembers his father God sobbing as he held the lamb against his chest. And Jesus can still see the image of his father handing over the innocent creature 
to Adam. And Jesus remembers his own words to Nicodemus just a few years before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. You see, once again, history would repeat. But this time, his father would not hand an animal over to the humans. But his father would hand over his only son, Jesus, over to the humans, to the human authorities, to be killed instead of the lamb. All the innocent lambs in earth's history killed for the sake of the exchange represented Jesus. And crying out to his father, Jesus says, Father, please, if there's any other way to save your children, take this suffering and death away from me. But if my death is the only way, then I trade my life, my innocent record, in exchange for their deserved death. Not long after this, a mob with torches and swords arrests Jesus in the middle of the night as though he was some murderous criminal. And filled with hatred and allied with the dark angels of Satan, the mob puts Jesus, an innocent man, the most innocent man, the only innocent man, on trial for sins against both people and God himself. And though they could not find sufficient evidence even to put him on trial, they find him guilty and they sentence Jesus to death. Not just any death, but a death that was reserved for the worst of the worst criminals in society. Death by crucifixion was and still would be one of the most painful and humiliating ways to die. And all through the torture, and all through the injustice, and all through the mocking, Satan is tempting Jesus to give up. He knows that Jesus has the power to do miracles, and he tempts Jesus to use his power for himself. But throughout his whole ministry, Jesus performs miracles and healings for others and for the glory of his Father in heaven. But Jesus never, ever uses his power for himself. From the time in the desert to the cross. And even while hanging on the cross, while feeling the enormous pain and humiliation, he still does not do anything as selfish if you could even call it selfish, as using his abilities for himself. Because if he did, humanity would be lost, and so would the universe. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, darkness covers the sky in the middle of the day. And the darkness descends... And the sins of, and guilt of every human being who ever existed. And the sins and the guilt of every human being who would ever be born in the future engulfs the mind of Jesus. And Jesus barely feels the physical pain. The physical pain is nothing. The pain of the cross itself doesn't even touch him anymore because the heaviness and the pain of the guilt of every human to ever exist overshadows everything else. The shame and guilt of every lie, every murder, every rape, every theft, every lustful thought, every put down, every insult, every punch, kick, whip, blackmail, bullying, and rude remark ever done or ever to be done by a man, woman, or child is put on his shoulders. My sins, your sins, everyone's dirty secrets and open shame separates Jesus from his Father. Remember, sin separates us from God. This is what happens at the cross. 
the most loving human being to have ever walked on the planet in this moment becomes the most abhorrent and sin-covered being on earth. The darkness covering Jesus from all this sin is so intense because of the sins of earth. Jesus is prevented from experiencing the presence of his own father for the first time in his life. Up until this point in time, Jesus, because he was sinless and pure, he could always talk to God. He could always feel God's presence in his life. But for the first time ever, he can't see him anymore. He can't feel him anymore or hear him anymore because sin has made it so that there is this shield around him. It feels for Jesus as though his father is no longer there, even though he was. Which is why before Jesus dies, he yells out, and this is the exact translation in the Greek, this is what he actually yells out. He yells out, Daddy, Daddy, where have you gone? But his father is there. But the sin has separated Jesus from his life source. And as lightning strikes across the sky and the exchange is finalized, Jesus cries out, It is is finished, and he dies, he dies. Jesus did not have to die, but he chose to, because it was the only way for God to save us while keeping the law of the universe. It's through the events in the Old Testament that we find not only the outcome of the gospel in the New Testament, but it's where we find the reason for Jesus and his ministry itself. It's the Old Testament. The gospel of Jesus as proclaimed in the New Testament can also be found in the Old Testament as evidence for today's study. We can only grasp the reason for the death of Jesus on the cross through the understanding of the sacrificial system. And we can only understand the purpose of that system, that system that just seems repulsive to us, by understanding the origin of the fall. The death of Jesus Christ answers the question that Satan told everyone could not be answered. It answers the question, how can God be both just and merciful? It shows that God is just, that the consequences of sin is death, but he can be merciful because he takes on the consequence himself so that we can live. What was done on that day on Calvary answered the question of God's love, not only for our world, but for the universe as a whole. John the Baptist said it right when he shouted to the crowds as Jesus approached, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 